Every age has produced people who think they can discover the hidden secrets of the universe. But often they tell such extraordinary tales about what they have discovered that it's difficult to believe them. The French writer Voltaire observed the scientists and natural philosophers of his day with great skepticism. Scientists who devise systems to explain the secrets of how the universe is made are like our travelers who go to Constantinople and describe the Sultan's harem. They have seen only the outside walls, but claim to know every detail of what the Sultan does with his concubines. Directly beneath the town that now bears Voltaire's name, Fernet Voltaire, is a particle accelerator, an atom smasher, that is a modern monument to the scientific enterprise Voltaire mocked. This is CERN, the European Centre for Nuclear Research. If Voltaire were alive today, it might be difficult to convince him that some of these scientists are discovering the secrets of the universe. Yes, we have cyclotron radiation! But even scientists like to relax, and playing at being subnuclear particles is just one sign of their familiarity with the complex world of the atom. In recent years, two new particles have been discovered here, called the W and the Z, and led to a Nobel Prize for the discoverers. Now a team at CERN is on the track of another particle, called Top Quark, hoping to repeat the successes of their colleagues. The structure of the atom is fairly well known now, thanks to 90 years of deeper and deeper probes through the outer shell and into the nucleus, a hundred thousandth the size of the atom. The nucleus contains most of the mass of the atom in particles called protons and neutrons. Once scientists had discovered this fact, they were bound to ask, are there smaller particles that make up protons and neutrons? It turns out that there are. A group of particles, sometimes called quarks, and sometimes quarks, at the whim of individual scientists. Quarks come in pairs. The lightest are up quark and down quark. Then there's a slightly heavier pair called strange and charm. The heaviest so far discovered is bottom quark and everyone believes that bottom has a partner, top quark, that is even more massive and waiting to be discovered. The race is now on to find top quark, and there are only two horses in the race, CERN and an American laboratory called Fermilab. The discovery will bring fame and glory to the winning team, and the competition is fierce. If CERN weren't there running, our guys would be a little more relaxed, and I don't want them to be relaxed. I don't want them to be on edge, so I think it's very good and every time I get a little uh, bitnet message uh, saying what they've achieved with their, uh, their luminosity, their machine, the number of collisions, I needle our guys and saying, look what they're doing at CERN. What's the matter with you sluggards? Uh, so I think the competition is, in that sense, beneficial. But fundamentally, I think the two machines, uh, well, we have to remember, Fermilab machine has three times the energy. So we have a tremendous task beyond the top. And if I had a choice, if I could arrange the, the near future, I would give the top to CERN, and I would like to find the heavy Z, uh, because the heavy Z is much more speculative. We know the top is there somewhere, but we don't know about the heavy Z, and the heavy Z is the road to grand unification. In any situation where the uh, discovery potential is high, there's usually more than one experiment which is trying to make the same discovery, and of course, uh, you want to be sure. Um, you also want to be first. Uh, my opinion has always been that it's better to be right than to be first. And there have been several occasions in the past when the people who've been first have been wrong. Parker's caution is understandable, given where he works. Five years ago, CERN issued this press release announcing, somewhat prematurely, the discovery of Top Quark. No one at CERN wants that to happen again. But mistakes are easy to make in this business. An experiment to discover new particles is probably one of the most complex scientific experiments there is. The starting point for the two research teams is a bottle of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest atom, with one proton in its nucleus. The scientists plan to use a huge electric voltage to rip the protons out of the hydrogen nucleus and accelerate them to high speeds to create very energetic collisions. 
They do this in a high voltage generator. A powerful electric voltage can pull the atoms apart and this apparatus can build up 700,000 volts to send through the container of hydrogen, releasing the protons from the heart of the atoms. The protons are pulled by an electric field towards a circular tube, a collider, several kilometers round. At Fermilab, this collider is called the Tevatron, but there's a similar circular collider at CERN called the SPS. The bunches of protons travel round the inside of the tube many times a second. Magnetic and electric fields around the tube give the bunch a series of kicks to keep them on track and increase their speed. Then another bunch of particles called antiprotons is injected to travel in the opposite direction and collide energetically with the protons. Although the teams have different circular colliders, they work on the same principle. If they can produce enough energetic collisions, they may create new atomic particles, including, the scientists hope, top quark. Now these look like very similar machines and they're both avidly searching for this top quark. That's a hot subject. But one has to remember that at least in the Fermilab collider, the top quark, when we started building this, uh, we sort of assumed it would already have been discovered. Uh, we didn't know it would be so elusive, and that depends, of course, on its mass. We still don't know where it is. It may be so heavy that it'll be difficult for us to find it. But we built the collider as a discovery machine, if you like. It's got the highest energy, it's exploring beyond the W and the Z, which was the CERN discovery for their collider. Well, we're both linking, looking for the top now because that's obviously something that's there. You know, one shoe dropped the bottom, the other shoe has to drop the top. If we have a bottom, we must have a top, so where is it? The most important piece of equipment for each team is the detector, a cluster of sophisticated instruments arranged around the collision point. The team with the most sensitive detector has a better chance of discovering top quark among the debris of the collisions. The Fermilab team in America is called CDF, Collider Detector at Fermilab, and the CERN team is named UA2 after their detector in Underground Area 2. Today, August 28, 1988, is an important day for the UA2 scientists. The detector has been moved away from the collider beam to undergo maintenance and tuning up to make sure that all its components are working at peak efficiency. Over the next three months, the SPS collider will produce billions of collisions for the UA2 team to analyze for evidence of top quark. There are 80 scientists in the team and they come from eight different European countries. This is the beam pipe, where there will be 150,000 particle collisions a second, timed so that they occur in the center of this circle. All around the collision point are measuring devices which detect electric charge, or flashes of light, for example, created by the fragments of debris that spray out from the individual collisions. The readings from the instruments are fed back to computers that reconstruct a picture of the collision. Somewhere in the pattern from one collision in a billion, there may be the signature of top quark. Today, the 600-ton detector is being moved back into the collider path on air cushions like miniature hovercraft, helped by liberal sprinklings of talcum powder. Guide rails keep the detector on target as it moves towards the arch between the maintenance hall and the beam line of the accelerator. As the massive detector moves forward at an inch a second, there's some concern that it doesn't get damaged. There's a worrying moment as the detector edges towards the gap in the wall. It looks as if it won't go through. In fact, some of the foil covering has come loose, making it look as if the detector is larger than it really is. And the whole instrument slides easily into place, past reminders on the wall of earlier accidents. Overseeing the operation is Luigi Di Lella, the spokesman for UA2, the nearest they have to a team leader in such a democratic group. 
Each of the individual elements is worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. The challenge of detecting subatomic particles has led scientists and engineers to stretch to the limits their knowledge of materials, electronics and computing. This device, the inner silicon detector, is wrapped round the beam pipe and is the nearest layer to the collision. The proton beam from one side and the antiproton beam from the other side will collide about in the center of this tube. And on the average, when there is an interesting uh, in interaction has happened, about 30, 40 charged particles will emerge from this collision point, which is infinitesimally small. So what's happening is these 30, 40 particles, they cross one layer after the other. So once they are out of the vacuum pipe, they cross the first layer of the UA2 detector, which is this inner silicon, where we have arranged now on the surface of this cylinder 192 silicon crystals, where each crystal is uh, about 300 micron thick. Here you have a sample of it. So of these objects, we have 192, once the detector is complete, which sit on this drum. The device is not just a sensitive detector, it contains complex computing circuitry to make an instantaneous selection of the most interesting collisions. The job of the scientists is to produce as many highly energetic collisions per second as possible, in the hope that a few of them will create top quark. There's an important figure called the luminosity that measures how well their colliders perform that task. One of the CDF team explains. These particles have a certain size, we call a cross-section, and it's literally that, it's just a cross-section. If you imagine a whole beam of them coming at you, then the size of the particle depends how much chance you have of hitting it, that's a cross-section. Okay? We measure that in barns, as in can't hit a barn door, that's the unit, and that's where it comes from. Now a nanobarn is one billionth of a barn, and this tells you luminosity tells you how many events you would get for a cross-section of a nanobarn. That is, if the particle had a size of one nanobarn, we would have made 50 of them at this point. The higher the luminosity they can achieve, the more steeply this curve will rise in the coming months, showing that they've accumulated a good number of collisions. As the experiment begins, each team weighs up the relative merits of the other. There are all sorts of factors that could give one team an advantage over the other, from equipment design to the number and skills of the members of each team. But there's another factor that's important, the energy the accelerators give to the particles. The more energetic the collisions, the more likely they are to produce new particles. And here, Fermilab has a distinct advantage. The key differences uh, between uh, our run this fall and CERN have to do, of course, with the energy. We'll be running three times higher energy and that helps us from a physics point of view. UA2 has a substantial amount of new equipment, new hardware, to make, uh, to make them more suited for this kind of measurement. So they uh, will uh, be in a very similar situation to us. Of, uh, even though those experiments have run for several years, they have enough new equipment that they will have to uh, continue to do some checkout of that apparatus in the beginning of their run. Um, but uh, I'm fully confident they'll get running uh, rather quickly and begin accumulating data. And their problems, as I say, will be much like ours. Uh, get the new gear running and then s settle down into steady running and collect as much data as you can and hope uh, like crazy the top uh, mass is within your range of uh, detectability. One factor that might act in UA2's favor is the number of collisions they produce. We hope very much that uh, we'll get uh, the highest number of collisions, possible number of collisions, and we are brainwashing the machine people in order to uh, also themselves feel the competition with the United States. Uh, yesterday I pointed out to them that the, uh, the previous two quarks, the charm and the bottom quark, had been discovered in the United States, hoping that they would uh, do also their share of work to have the top discovered here. As some of the UA2 scientists meet at the beginning of the experiment, they're keen to see whether Luigi's brainwashing has worked. Earlier, they'd been pessimistic about how much useful data they would be able to gather in the experimental run. Now, Luigi brings them news from a meeting he's just had with the accelerator scientists. The figure they're all interested in here is the luminosity, the measure of the number and intensity of the collisions they might accumulate by Christmas. 
If the accelerator scientists can deliver more than two inverse picobarns, the quirky units that measure luminosity, they'll be happy. Three inverse picobarns is a healthy total to work with, and the prediction is a promising start to the run, provided the promise can be fulfilled. Very conservative number, uh, which uh, is likely to be improved uh, as the run. Uh, over at Fermilab, the CDF team are also confident that they can get off to a good start as they settle into a daily and usually nightly routine. Uh, SDA is running over SDA here. is running. In the Tevatron control room, dozens of screens tell the scientists how well they're doing. At the beginning of each run, they're interested in whether or not they've succeeded in injecting six bunches of antiprotons, known as P-bars, so that they collide regularly with six bunches of protons. Okay, Terry, go ahead, fire at will. Okay, injecting P-bars. Each hump at the top of the screen marks a bunch of protons. Now they've been joined at the bottom by the first bunch of antiprotons. Okay, so now this is going to repeat every 40 seconds, okay, for another 160 seconds. So in 160 seconds, we'll have all of our antiprotons in, uh, evenly spaced in between the six proton bunches, and then we will accelerate. Now we're actually accelerating. In case nobody's mentioned it, we're about 99.9998975% the speed of light. <laughs> okay, well, now we have, you can see we have 12 indications of our beam. We have six proton bunches in, and we have six anti proton bunches in. Okay, so we have all of our beam that we require for this store. And we have a, an initial luminosity of what we call 1.64 E30. That tells us that uh, this was a very good shot considering we get the amount of antiprotons that we took out of the accumulator. Uh, we're much more efficient with this shot and each shot we try to improve things, okay? And this one is a success. Okay, so it has uh, lots of beam for the experimenters. Hopefully they'll get lots of events recorded on tape and make whatever discoveries they're going to make. So that's it. During the autumn, everything runs very smoothly yeah, and the team acquires a new spokesman. It has been a problem in recent weeks and as I've said to a number of people in, uh, in my years in experimental physics, it is the most pleasant problem I've ever had, is the problems associated with having too much good data. We never expected that the accelerator would work this well this soon so that we would have so much data so quickly. And it's a, it's a marvelous problem to have. I recommend it. At UA2 during the same period, the nightly routine is exactly the same, trying to get enough protons and antiprotons circulating in their accelerator, the SPS, to produce a good number of collisions. On this evening in November, the results are failing to live up to expectations. They came in looking very well. Then as we started to accelerate, they, were, they stayed in all right. But then as we went through the squeezing process to try and bring the beams down to a very small size at the point of the inter interaction where the, uh, where the experiments are, then we lost quite a bit of beam. And so maybe we've got to, to chew that up a little bit. The bunches of particles show themselves as peaks on the screen. There's no problem getting the protons circulating in the right positions. It's the antiprotons that seem to be a problem as the scientists try to capture them and squeeze them into tight enough bunches. Okay. As the night wears on, the scientists try to work out why they aren't seeing the expected number of antiprotons. We're going to have other problems, I think, with the Q. because when we took, took shots before the queue was completely wrong. So uh, let, let's take this shot and measure it, see what to do next. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a real program in here. Any major experiment will have bad patches like tonight. With equipment as complex as the SPS, there are a million things that can go wrong. Electric fields, magnets, the vacuum in the tube, the computing circuitry, all have to be considered. How is the cue, Roger? The cue? I can't measure it. We're setting the cue on the currents. We're going to the currents that we know are right, so... Just 
tu as dans les cuves Tu as des valeurs J'ai 13 800, mais je ne sais quel, quel hein? plan. Je ne sais pas. In fact, overall, during the autumn, the CERN accelerator has been producing more than 70% of the target number of useful collisions. And nights like this are a frustrating interruption, as UA2 try to gather as much data as possible before Christmas. UA2? At the end of the evening, Vince Hatton sums up the day's events. The way I see it for tonight is that we, we've got a shot in, and it's, it's quite a reasonable shot. The physicists can now, uh, can now work for the next uh, um, 15 or 16 hours. Tomorrow we'll, we'll try again, and we'll look at some of the problems we've seen today, and uh, in the quiet of tomorrow morning, look at the results, which are all stored on the computer, look to see where things didn't go quite as well as they should have gone, and then prepare things for the shot tomorrow afternoon. It's not up to the standard that, uh, that we, were, we were achieving in, um, in, at the beginning of October. And, uh, well, we, uh, we're not sure yet. It looks as if we're losing more of the antiprotons than, than we should. The transmission of the beam into the machine and accelerated and through into, into squeezing is, um, is, not, is not very efficient. And that's something we'll have to look at tomorrow. For Luigi Di Lella, the fact that the experiment was running in the winter led to additional complications during the three months from September. The machine started on schedule on uh, the 12th of September, I would say within uh, three or four days, was working at peak luminosity and we were all pleased that during the first uh, uh, three weeks it worked uh, like, a, like a Swiss clock uh, with no fault uh, whatsoever. And, uh, well, uh, we thought we had succeeded in motivating uh, the machine people to the point that uh, they had felt uh, really their pride at stake and uh, therefore they, they really had uh, tuned the machine uh, to, the best, uh, to the best. And then since then uh, the machine has been uh, working in a sort of an average way, uh, working very nicely for two or three days and then uh, being off uh, for various failures. For example, a thunderstorm would trip the machine off and we would be off for uh, something like 24 hours. And then uh, finally last week, uh, with, uh, there was a cold spill over Europe and uh, there is a uh, contract between CERN and the uh, French electricity company that provides uh, electricity to CERN, by which if uh, they decide so, they can switch us off during working days, but uh, when the machine uh, goes off for four days, then it's very painful to start it up again. And in fact, we are now suffering from these, uh, uh, from the fact that the machine has been off. Uh, they have difficulties in turning it on again and run it at the maximum performance. When a particle of matter like a proton collides with antimatter like antiprotons, the quarks that make up the particles can produce enough energy to create new particles, including, the scientists hope, top quark. And it really is creation that's taking place, as we now know, thanks to Einstein. Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared says that energy and mass are forms of the same thing. The sun, for example, produces heat by continually changing atoms into energy. This has had at least two modern consequences, the atom bomb and the creation of new subatomic particles. Just as a small amount of mass in an atom bomb produces a large amount of energy, the reverse can be made to happen. If a large amount of energy is concentrated in a very small area, it can turn into a small amount of new matter, either a new type of particle or, more often, just other examples of familiar ones. Most people, I think, have heard of uh, one equation in physics, which is a famous Einstein equation, E equals uh, mc squared. What this tells you is that uh, energy and matter are interchangeable. So the sort of thing which is done in an accelerator is that you take, uh, say, a proton or an electron, relatively light particles, you uh, accelerate them in electric fields uh, up to extremely high energies. Then you've got, say, a proton, for example, which has, uh, well, in the case of the accelerator here, about 300 times as much energy as it would do if you just picked it off the table. Now, you collide two of these, this gives you a total of about 600 times uh, the energy of a normal proton. This energy, then, can be converted 
uh, either into energetic particles or into very massive particles, again using E equals mc squared but in the opposite direction. What we do is we annihilate matter with antimatter. By annihilating it, it, it annihilates completely all the characteristics of the matter and the antimatter and you're left with pure energy which has no reason to go back into its original form. It can go into any form that it cares to, and therefore it's a very good way to create new forms because it will cr produce every possible form of matter. So if you want to produce a new generation of uh, quarks, you can take the good old generations, annihilate one with the other, and you'll have the energy available to make any of the available generations up to that mass. So that's how we aim to produce the top quark. Top quark... Uh has the same mass whether we produce it or not. It's, it's not that uh, suddenly by doing the experiment we invent a mass for the top quark. Uh, for example, we believe that the top quark, uh, there were lots of them very early in the history of the universe, and that, uh, for example, when the universe was less than a microsecond old, there might have been as many top quarks as any other type of quark. Uh, and the top quark then had a definite mass, but that mass was so large that it was unstable, it broke up, it decayed into lighter particles, and there weren't any more top quarks in the universe for a long time, until now we come along, and uh, by putting enough French electricity into the, into the accelerator, we produce enough energy, maybe, to produce top quarks again. At Christmas 1988, both teams closed down their accelerators until the spring. After they've had a break, the scientists will start the important task of inspecting the data they have gathered from millions of collisions to see if any of them has produced top quark. At the end of each year at CERN, there's a Christmas show satirizing the work of some of the 5,000 scientists who work there. This year, the International Race for the Top is portrayed as two competing soap operas, CERN Asti and Dallas SC, a reference to the new American super collider that is to be built in Texas. Most of the humor is impenetrable to outsiders as the men look for top quarks beneath the blouses of the women scientists and the women inspect the men for missing energy, a key phrase in the data analysis that is about to start. But what we really need to beat Cernesty in the ratings war is a much bigger ranch. The script for the Christmas show is written by John Ellis, a theoretical physicist at CERN, who spends his time thinking about quarks rather than looking for them. He's confident that UA2 have a good chance in the race. I think the UA2 group uh, is by now very well prepared. I mean, they're working with a detector which has uh, been operating for several years. Uh, they understand it reasonably well. They know where all the bodies are buried. And uh, I think they have a fair chance of doing their analysis uh, quicker than the guys at Fermilab. Of course, the guys at Fermilab have uh, also a really key advantage in this business is they have more energy than uh, what we have here. That means that uh, it's easier for them to produce the top quark. Uh, in particular, the heavier the top quark uh, is, the more difficult it is to produce it here. So that's the big advantage of the, uh, of the Americans. I think the team here is very good. They're very enthusiastic. They're very keen. Uh, they've got have all the analysis tools which they need. So uh, if the top quark is there, I have no doubt they'll find it pretty quickly. In spite of Ellis's kind words, the experimental physicists often feel misunderstood by their theoretical colleagues. I think that uh, it would be very instructive for you to uh, interview a theorist uh, and in order to discover how little they know about uh, uh, the way experimentalists do their research. Uh, they probably, they don't know anything because uh, they, I think they even don't want to know. Um, they believe that we use screwdrivers and then when, uh, some, sometimes we find results which we feed to them and it is to them to, to make sense out of them. But uh, they haven't yet understood that uh, uh, many of them, not all, I mean it depends, uh, 
Many of them believe that uh, the discovery of the top will be just uh, like one or two events which you suddenly see, reconstructed by the computer, you get a printout, possibly a color printout, and then you go around showing it like a flag and saying, this is top, this is top. This happened for the W and the Z, because there was no other process that could simulate events with that configuration. But for top, we know of many other background events that can appear like top and are not. In fact, in the early days of particle physics, new particles were often discovered on the basis of one observation, a golden event it was sometimes called. A photograph like this, for example, would show a collision that was only explicable if the scientists assumed that this tiny little track here was produced by a new particle. Champagne corks would pop, a paper would be quickly written, and a Nobel Prize could be in the post. But the search for top was far less simple. Out of the millions of collisions that occurred behind this concrete wall, only a few would even look as if they produced top quark. The streams of data that flowed through these 10,000 cables would have to be sifted to reject most of it and preserve only those collisions that looked promising. The information about the most promising collisions would be saved on cassette and stored so that the scientists could look at them later. Three-dimensional pictures could be created of the events that had occurred in the detector days or weeks before by using some of the world's most powerful computers. The lifetime of top quark was expected to be too short, a hundred million million millionth of a second, for it to show itself directly. Instead, the scientists looked for a pattern like this, called the signature of top quark. It consists of an electron, two jets of other particles, and a particle called a neutrino. But there was one complication. The neutrino was invisible and had to be revealed indirectly with a mathematical trick. Here's an analogy. This collision between two snooker balls could not happen in real life on a flat table. The collision could not leave both the balls going off upwards because all the force of the white ball was going from right to left before the collision. What actually happened was this. In fact, it's possible to work out mathematically from the faked collision that there must have been another ball involved, otherwise one of the laws of physics would have been broken. From this image alone, the path and the mass of the missing particle could be worked out. In the top signature, there's also a missing ball, the invisible neutrino, whose existence is only revealed when the scientists add up all the energy coming into the collision and find that some of it has disappeared after the collision, carried away by the neutrino. There was another problem with the data. They didn't know how heavy top quark was. It might actually be too massive a particle for their accelerators to produce. This possibility made Mel Shockett wary about predicting total success for CDF. There are two answers. It, certainly our, our confidence and our ability to see top if it's in the mass range where we would be sensitive has grown because the accelerator is performing extremely well. And in fact, we should wind up with uh, perhaps five times as much data as we had expected when the ran, run began. Uh, the other answer is one that, that uh, there's no change because we don't know what mass the top quark has. And if its mass is too high, we just are not going to be able to see it because the, an accelerator of this energy won't be able to produce it. So it's, it's a little bit of, we're doing well, but nature has to be kind to us and put it where we can see it. The five quarks that have already been discovered all weigh less than five GeV, the units of mass. The experiments are like trying to peer through a window, looking for particles of greater and greater mass. So far, previous teams have explored as high as 40 GeV without finding top quark. Now UA2 and CDF are lifting the blind to 60 or even higher. But the design of the CERN accelerator means that UA2 are unlikely to be able to detect anything heavier than 70 to 90 GeV at the most.
However, CDF's more powerful accelerator could enable them to explore much higher masses. UA2 know this and pin their hopes on the possibility that top will lie below 85 or 90. If it doesn't, then CDF will have the field to themselves. We have an advantage because the energy here is so much larger. The range of mass where we can find top in this run is probably up to 100 GeV, maybe a little higher. At CERN, they can find it if it's as high as 70 and probably not much higher. So if it's in the range below 70, there's a real dogfight on. If it's above 70, then we probably have it alone to ourselves. But of course, we don't know where it is. There are several different signatures for top. The Fermilab people, for example, are looking for one that includes a particle called a muon. But even when they think they've got a perfect signature, what might be a golden event, they may actually be looking at a forgery. The reason is that even though the types of event signatures that we're looking for are very rare and very characteristic of the production decay of a top court, there are other processes that we know about that can occur at a very improbable level that could simulate or look the same. So consequently, if we observe one very characteristic event, such as, for example, an electron and muon, we cannot immediately conclude that that came only from the production of a top quark. We have to understand all of the other possible processes that could have taken place, and in some way given a similar signature. Now, in general, it's therefore impossible to tell from the observation of a single event that once discovered something new. As the data analysis begins, the UA2 collaboration meets in Geneva to hear some early results. Andy Parker has boiled 45,000 promising collisions down to 19 events that have a top signature. But that's not enough. As Brig Williams explained, the scientists expect to see a certain number of collisions that look like top. The question is, have they seen significantly more than they expected? Um, I've used the spike hill routine that Lara supplied. And re the more events you have, the more confident you can be of your analysis because you're attempting to dig out an excess of events over what you see. Now, if you have um, 10 events in your sample and you expected five, you're not very confident that that's an excess. If you have uh, 100 events in your sample and you expected 50, you're very confident that it's an excess. So the, the amount of data counts. Uh, even though you may, in principle, have what looks like a signal, you really need that, uh, that data to be sure. Once serious results start emerging, rumors begin to flow between the two laboratories. UA2, that they had a candidate sample, but that they didn't understand the background. I heard that second hand. With so many people in each team, it's difficult to keep things quiet, and the fierce competition inflates every result, however insignificant, to giant proportions. There was a rumor that was uh, going through the halls of CERN last year that we had discovered the top uh, at 60 GeV, and so to be cute, one one of the uh, the physicists here sent back a message saying we have not discovered the top at 60 GeV. And of course, we had nothing at all. But it's, it's, a, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a game. But on the other hand, it's obviously very important. And uh, if it's to be found, we want to find it first. Rumors become feverish as the two teams prepare to report their progress at an international physics conference to be held in Italy in February this year. The ski resort of La Tuile in the Aosta Valley is to be host to a conference about the current state of particle physics, and there's to be a session on the search for top quark, at which a member of each team will give a talk. Each team holds an in-house meeting before La Tuile, during which they discuss exactly how much information to allow their own representative to give away. Current analysis holds up. The, the Fermilab meeting is a lively one. At the conference, the other delegates will be looking for some sort of statement from the CDF delegate, Mel Schockett, about a limit for the mass of top quark. But how strong could that statement be? Listen, John, you yourself said you would agree with 50 to 60, so what we're quibbling about is 45 to 50. Fine, 50, 60, fine, OK. But 45 to 60 is not fine. But 45 or 34 is I don't believe that. But I don't personally think that it's really important at the present time 
time to really make a very strong statement on that. Because my, my worry is that if by some chance, I mean, mischance, we, we, we are wrong, then we are in a bad shape. In fact, some of the team feel in their bones that top quark is probably heavier than 80 GeV, but such gut feelings are no substitute for careful measurement. Is that acceptable or not? The thing that we have to be careful about is that we don't present things in a premature fashion. The, the last thing that you want to do is uh, do a partial analysis, make a conclusion, announce it publicly, and then two weeks later find out that in fact you hadn't completed it, and when you completed it, it's not there. Over at CERN, the collaboration has similar worries about what to allow their representative, Jean-Paul Repelin, to report. We were afraid that uh, at already at this early stage, they could uh, give limits which would have been much higher than the one, I mean much higher, higher say, than the one we were uh, able to give. And uh, that's not a nice situation where you come with a result and the, the, uh, the physicist who is going to talk after you is going to show that in fact uh, your results are not so interesting because he's, he's pushing the results even further. So in that, in that sense, uh, that's, that was our, our worry. And uh, it seems that, uh, in fact, in CDF, they are also, strangely enough, they, they were also in the same situation where they were afraid that uh, we were going to have uh, results or uh, limits uh, higher than, uh, than one could expect. As the two teams assemble at the conference hotel, Shockett and Rappelin have a polite but wary conversation. Neither is giving too much away. Even at this stage, each of them is prepared for the other to pull something out of the hat. Although the rumor mill has ruled out the possibility that either team has yet discovered top, there is still a lot of latitude in the possible mass limit that will be reported. It's half a blessing if we can rule out the mass range that UA2 is sensitive, because although it's, it's true that our sensitivity goes well beyond theirs, in the current run, it doesn't go that far beyond theirs. And if we rule out the mass range where they're sensitive, we're, we've ruled out more than half of our available mass range also. And it's, it would be nice if we were the ones to discover it. On the other hand, I'd like someone to discover it. So it's, uh, I'm not quite sure. And what we, what we will say, I mean, even putting aside the uh, semi-qualitative rather than quantitative statement, it will not rule out the full mass range that they're sensitive to. They're sensitive uh, up to uh, something over 70 GeV. And what I will say tomorrow is 60 GeV. So it's, it's, not, it's not there yet. And from what I hear, they will say something similar, that they think they would have seen something if it were between 40 and 60 and that they haven't. But that's the rumor I hear. <laughs> Although Rappelin is the UA2 delegate, at the last minute, Luigi Di Lella and some of the other members of the team decide to battle their way through the snow to hear Schockett's talk, just in case he has any surprises. In particular, Luigi wants to know whether CDF have seen any E-mu pairs, one of their possible signatures for top. If they haven't seen any, that could mean top is much heavier than they hoped. I don't know what uh, Mel Schockett will say today, but uh, he will probably say something of the order of 60 to 70. I really don't know. But uh, in the near future, if uh, their experiment works well, and if they don't see emu pairs, they should be able to then, say, exclude uh, tops, uh, top quarks with a mass uh, smaller than uh, 80 to 90 GeV, which means exclude automatically our possibility to actually see the top. Now, since these masses are totally unpredicted by theory, I mean, uh, then if they say the top quark is heavier than 75, we would still have about 15 GeV of window. But this window would be open for us only when we have taken the full statistics. So I would say, and analyzed uh, all the data, so I would say by the end of the summer, we would be able to say something. And by that time, they may have pushed uh, this uh, limit even further. So if indeed they say today that they exclude the top, they exclude the top larger than uh, uh, the top uh, uh, 
uh, lighter than 75 GeV, it would, very, it would probably mean that uh, we would not see it at CERN. The session on top quark now, is a reminder that even negative analysis, findings can be useful. I show no evidence for the presence of the top in the mass range 40 to 60, where the detector is found to have a good sensitivity. And it's clear that uh, we are not swamped by background. We can have not much finding more top quark so far tells the scientists something useful about its mass. If the experiment has been done properly and failed to find it up to 60 GeV, then the elusive particle must be heavier than the scientists hoped. Of course, Dilella already knows this, and he waits to hear whether Shocket has the same message. Number of final state channels. There's still a great deal of work which is in progress and has to be done. If the current analysis holds up and we accept the result from the E plus E minus colliders, then the mass of the top is not likely to be below approximately 60 GeV over C squared, again, assuming the Shock normal Shockit has also squared. announced that top is heavier than 60 GeV, but Dilella senses that when the data are fully analyzed, the particle may well prove to be even heavier and out of UA2's reach. Well, I think it's uh, certainly very difficult for us. Uh, if there is a top, uh, it has to be lighter than uh, 75 to, to 80, and there it's really very difficult. It, it's also difficult for them. Uh, Mel said it clearly that uh, around when the, if the top has a mass that is similar to the W, it's very difficult to see, and I agree with him entirely. So that's why we say, well, we are sensitive. We can see it relatively easily up to 70 GeV and then it really becomes difficult and uh, since uh, I believe now from my feeling is that it's heavier than 60 then our window is really very little. Knowing Luigi I think his, uh, his feelings are, are mixed. On, on the one hand uh, the, the result that we have indicates that uh, they're less likely to find it. On the other hand, we haven't uh, come out definitively and said that the mass of the top is above 75 GeV, which would really put him out of business. So probably uh, not as happy as he would like to be, but not as despondent as he, as he could have been. At a chamber music concert for the conference delegates, the two rival team members sit side by side. They must both be thinking about the implications of the failure to find top quark so far. It's looking as if the window of exploration has got to be opened wider, maybe up to 140 or 150 GeV, and only CDF have the energy to do that. It probably also means that they can relax a little, knowing that the heat is off. In July, the UA2 collaboration meet in Cambridge to discuss where they've reached and where to go next. The main topic of discussion is the failure to find top quark. In the UA2 collaboration, we feel that uh, it was a little bit disappointing not to see the top because uh, the fact that uh, we were able to establish a limit means that if it had existed, we would have seen it. And so, uh, well, it's... Uh, dirty trick of nature to have put the top quark so heavy. So my impression is at present that if top is to be discovered at all, it will be discovered by CDF or the other new experiment called D0, which comes into operation in 91 at Fermilab, provided the uh, machine is improved. In other words, provided the luminosity of the Tevatron Collider is boosted up by a factor of about 5 to 10, for which they have plans, but not yet the money. It's the way life goes. There are only a uh, very small number of fundamental particles in the universe, and you have to be very lucky to find one. Um, we were in a unique position that we had the opportunity to look where nobody else could look and had looked before. And um, obviously the odds were, were reasonable, but we know that the uh, theoretical upper limit on the top quark masses at 200 GeV, which is a long way from 70. So I guess the odds were probably something like uh, three to one against always. And uh, at least we did a, a good experiment and we've closed off that particular piece. I'm, I'm quite happy. I mean, the most disappointing thing would be to, to have failed to do the experiment properly so that we didn't have confidence in the result. That would mean that, that we'd done a bad job. But as it is, I'm content that we, we did a good job in the time and 
I'm very pleased that CDF didn't find it before us. <laughs> for the two teams, there's still plenty of physics to be done. Although the search for top has taken a lot of their energy, they're also exploring many other aspects of the intricate world of the atomic nucleus. Particles like Ws and Zs, muons and gluons, neutrinos and photinos. And Mel Shockett, ever optimistic, finds cause for hope in the very elusiveness of the particle he and his team have failed to find. It's natural to have expected that there would be a great deal of disappointment that we didn't discover the top so far. And I, I think that, that there is a little bit of that. Certainly, we would rather have found it than not. But it, it's interesting in that not having found it, and let's assume that, we, that when we completely analyze this year's data, we, we will not have seen it. And that would indicate that the mass is above 80 or 90 GeV. The higher the mass of the top is, the more extraordinary the top quark is. Why is it so heavy where all of the other quarks are so much lighter? It becomes more and more extraordinary the heavier it, it becomes and may point to, to, to rather uh, deep implications about the structure of, of elementary particles.